The following film is the video portion of an E64 lesson. E64 is the computerized curriculum designed for home schools, Christian schools, family worship, Sunday schools, and church Bible study groups. The software contains many features, including family worship, music, competition builder, computer supervised lesson plans, and more. Let me tell you a little story about a man named Millard Fillmore. Born in New York State on January 7th, 1800, he would become the first president born in the 19th century. Growing up, he apprenticed as a cloth maker and eventually found an appreciation for law. At 26, he married Abigail Powers and together raised two children. Millard's reputation as a smart and accomplished lawyer led him to own one of the most successful law firms in New York. During his years, he also served as an assemblyman and congressman. In 1848, Millard Fillmore was nominated as vice president running alongside Zachary Taylor, who eventually won. On July 9, 1850, Fillmore became the 13th President of the United States, succeeding President Taylor, who died in office from a stomach condition. He became the last member of the Whig Party to serve as President. During his time in office, he famously passed the Compromise of 1850 and started the White House Library. Years earlier, he co-founded the University of Buffalo, where he served as Chancellor, while at the same time serving as Vice President and President. On March 8, 1870, Millard Fillmore died at the age of 74 after suffering a stroke. And there you go, a little story about a man named Millard. Let me tell you a little story about a man named Franklin Pierce. Born in a log cabin in New Hampshire on November 23rd, 1804, he would become the first president in history to affirm his oath of office on a law book rather than a Bible. As the son of a politician and governor, Franklin seemed destined for the political life. In 1826, he entered law school and eventually became a very successful lawyer. At the age of 27, he was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives, becoming the youngest congressman at the time. He also served in the Senate. A likable man, he was nominated for governor of New Hampshire and U.S. Attorney General, but refused both. At 30 years old, he married Jane Means Appleton and together had three children. Sadly, all three died young. In 1852, Franklin Pierce was elected as the nation's 14th president. He became the only president to deliver an inaugural speech from memory and only president in history to have his original cabinet serve an entire term. A month after his inauguration, his vice president, William King, died, leaving him without a VP for four years. Twelve years later, on October 8, 1869, President Franklin Pierce died of liver disease at the age of 64. And there you go, a little story about a man named Franklin. Let me tell you a little story about a man named James Buchanan. Born in Pennsylvania on April 23rd, 1791, he would become the only president in history to never marry. The second of 11 children, it was certainly easy for James to get lost in the family name. Determined to stand out, he attended law school where he became one of Pennsylvania's best attorneys. Following a successful law career, Buchanan served in the House of Representatives, Senate, and as Secretary of State under President James Poe. In fact, no Secretary of State has been president since. He was even given a Supreme Court nomination, but declined. In 1856, James Buchanan became the nation's 15th president. Buchanan operated under the constitutional belief that the U.S. Constitution was the highest authority in our country. This lost him a lot of support when a decision needed to be made about slaves in the South, as the Constitution originally made room for slavery. Historians say his failure to deal with the attempted secession of states before the Civil War is the worst presidential mistake in history. On June 1, 1868, James Buchanan died in Pennsylvania at the age of 77. And there you go, a little story about a man named James. Let me tell you a little story about a man named Abraham Lincoln. Born on February 12, 1809, he and Lyndon Johnson would eventually be known as the tallest presidents in history, standing six foot four. Raised in a one-room log cabin, he was mostly self-educated. 
a lover of books, Lincoln served as a lawyer, state legislator, and congressman. In 1842, he married Mary Todd and together raised four boys. Sadly, only one lived past 18. On November 6, 1860, Lincoln was elected to the first of two terms as the nation's 16th president and one of the most controversial, becoming the first Republican to hold the office. As president, he welcomed two more states into the Union, led the country through the Civil War, and signed the Emancipation Proclamation. He also delivered the Gettysburg Address, one of the most famous speeches in history. On April 15, 1865, six days after the surrender of the Confederate Army, Abe was shot and killed by John Wilkes Booth during a play at Ford's Theater. Ten days later, Booth was found and killed by authorities. Lincoln was the first president to be assassinated and was buried in Springfield, Illinois. Today, Lincoln's image can be seen on the penny, $5 bill, and Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. And there you go, a little story about a man named Abe. Let me tell you a little story about a man named Andrew Johnson. Born in Raleigh, North Carolina on December 29, 1808, Andrew grew up in poverty. With no formal education, he taught himself how to read and write. At 18, he married 16-year-old Eliza McCardle and together raised five children. Andrew's wife continued his education, teaching him algebra and improved reading and writing skills. He later served in the U.S. House of Representatives, Senate, and as Governor of Tennessee. In 1864, Andrew replaced Hannibal Hamlin on the re-election ticket for President Abraham Lincoln, which they won. A year later, Lincoln was assassinated while attending a play at Ford's Theater. The next day, Andrew Jackson was sworn in as the nation's 17th president, becoming the first VP to succeed the president presidency following an assassination. However, his attempt to fire one of his cabinet members led him to become the first president to be impeached. He narrowly escaped a guilty verdict by the Senate. In 1875, following his presidency, Andrew Jackson was once again elected to the U.S. Senate, making him the only former president to do so. However, a few months later on July 31st, he died of a stroke at the age of 66. And there you go, a little story about a man named Andrew. Let me tell you a little story about a man named Hiram Ulysses Grant. Born in Point Pleasant, Ohio on April 27, 1822, he would become the first president elected after the abolishment of slavery. At 17, he entered West Point Military Academy, thanks to the nomination of an area congressman who mistakenly put his name down as Ulysses S. Grant, which he kept, eventually earning him the nickname Uncle Sam. At 26, he married Julia Boggs Dent and together raised four children. As a soldier, Grant served under future President Zachary Taylor in the Mexican-American War, where he learned the methods of his commanders on the battlefield. He would eventually become a revered general for the Union Army during the Civil War, where he used his knowledge of combat to defeat the Confederate Army. This led to his enormous popularity, and in 1868, Ulysses S. Grant was elected as the nation's 18th president. Four years later, he was re-elected, making him the first president to serve two full terms in 40 years. While he was known as a strong advocate for civil rights, his office was plagued by numerous scandals and bribery, which is ironic, seeing how his face marks the $50 bill. On July 23, 1885, Ulysses S. Grant died of throat cancer at the age of 63. And there you go, a little story about a man named Ulysses. We are pioneers, adventurers. We are treasonous rebels. We are inventive. We are victorious. We are out of this world. We are equal. We are kind. We are Americans. We do not need to be led. We lead. Knowledge is power. Be empowered. Freedomproject.com The film you have just watched is the video portion of an E64 lesson. E64 is the software curriculum that provides education with a strong biblical worldview. And now, here's Bethany to show you how E64 helps my wife, Jacqueline, plan for some special times to focus on important tasks 
and still manage the children's education. Hi, my name is Bethany, and this is my mother, Jacqueline. Tell us what you're doing today, Mom. I'm working in the office today. I have about four hours worth of work to do to finish up our income taxes for the year and get them in the mail. And since the children are a great interruption to that process, making it virtually impossible to finish, Maddie is going to be supervising their schoolwork today for me, and they're all forbidden to come in the office. <laughs> <laughs> so the children are on their own. What are they doing? Does today have to be a non-school day? Not at all, because we use E64. Let's start in the den and see what the children are doing. We have three laptop computers set up here in the den. Let's visit with Sutara first. Hi, Sutara. Why don't you tell us what you're working on today? I'm working on E64 math. Wow. So what other things can you do with E64? English, history, science, and Bible studies. That's neat. So how do you know what lesson you're supposed to be working on? I don't have to know. I just log in with my name, and the program goes right to the lesson where I'm supposed to be. And if I stop in the middle of a lesson, when I sign back in, it remembers where I was. That's great. Let's go take a look at what Madison and Gavito are doing. Hi, boys. What are you all working on today? Learning to read. What are you reading about? No, I'm the ark. It's so cool. Look, here's all the animals coming out of the ark. That is cool. Let's go see what Madara is working on. Hi, Madi. I see you're doing your E64 schoolwork. What are you studying? Today I'm learning about how to care for babies and infants. Aw, that sounds so exciting. What else will you do today? Today is Mom's bill paying day. So in addition to my own schoolwork, it's my job to see that the children do their chores and their schoolwork. There are not enough computers for everybody. So while Joshua is doing his E64, I'll have Yedek working on his chores. After about an hour, I'll have them swap out. I do the same thing with Armand and Sitara. How do you know what each child needs to be working on? Mom has chore cards she makes for each one of the children. So I just have to read their card to know what chores they are supposed to do. And she has already made their lesson plan for E64. So I just follow the lesson plan for each child. The computer keeps track of their schoolwork. All I have to do is make sure they are working and not being idle. How do you do that? That's easy. Watch this. If I press F3, it comes up with a daily record showing everything I've done today, including the times. So from time to time, I just go around, look at the daily record for each of the children. I can see everything he or she has done or not done, as the case may be. Thank you, Madi. Let's go see what's going on in the great room. Here we have Armand. What are you working on today, Armand? Right now I'm working for Wally. Building question sets for just the Bible. Wally makes the videos and I do the question sets. That's interesting. What else will you be doing today? I will have to do my E64 lessons. What kind of lessons? Math, English, history, science, and Bible studies. Thank you so much, Armand. Now let's go see what Wally's doing. Hi, Wally. What are you working on? I'm working on creating the video for the next lesson in Mom's Learning to Read lesson series. Wow. Will you be doing anything else today? Yes, I'm going to be working on my E64 lessons. Thank you, Wally. And now, we see how Jacqueline can keep the children on track with their schoolwork and still have time to get her important paperwork done. The key is the lesson plan feature of E64. Because she has designed lesson plans for each of the children, E64 will provide the instruction with very little intervention needed by a teacher. A third feature is the family worship mode, which is ideal for family worship, school chapel services, family Sunday school classes, or church Bible study groups. Once you set up your lesson plan, this mode offers instruction and catechism one lesson section at a time.
reminds you to do prayer, thanksgiving and praise, Bible memorization, and includes a complete music section with songs and hymns for worship. Each song can be played with or without the vocals. Another E64 feature is the competition mode, where you create a lesson plan and the program randomly selects question sets from the lessons to create a fun and exciting competition, which can be as small as the competition our family does every day in our daily family worship, to as large as the Southeast Bible competition we conducted with multiple rounds and prizes, including a new laptop computer and tickets to a major theme park. Another feature is Apples of Gold, a computerized parlor game for more advanced students, where two clue givers devise clues to help their teams come up with a phrase from the Bible. To schedule the homeschool advantage, to come to your church or homeschool conference, and teach your people how to use computer software to build strong biblical households, contact Captain Brett at 678-570-2195 or email terabenth at inbox.com.